When someone has been missing for a long period of time, hope of them ever being found alive begins to dwindle, and with good reason, as they are very often never located. In some cases, however, the unthinkable happens when missing people turn up alive decades after they vanished. Number 5 In December of 1993, 28-year-old Judith Bello was working at the National Food Corporation in Stanwood, which is located in Washington. One morning, she arrived at work as usual but left abruptly without reason and didn't return. When she didn't arrive back home and didn't pick up her three-year-old son from daycare, she was reported as a missing person. Her car was found later outside of a post office in Stanwood, but there was no trace of Judith. Snohomish County Sheriff's detectives were convinced that she'd been the victim of a crime, as they thought it to be very unlikely that she would just abandon her three-year-old son. This triggered a massive search effort and a crime investigation that would carry on for the next 12 years. When she had not been found years later, her profile was added to a deck of cards along with seven other people who had vanished under suspicious circumstances. Judith was featured on the Eight of Hearts. She was the first person among those featured to be located. In 2011, 18 years after her disappearance, detectives received a call from Judith in which she told them that she was alive and well. She was living in Fontana, California and had started a new life for herself with a new family. She stated that she had seen herself on the sheriff's website and decided to put the mystery to rest. She explained that she decided to disappear because of serious problems between her and her husband, and she didn't contact her family again because she was scared of him and feared that he would cause trouble for her siblings. She would then learn that her husband also disappeared three months after she did, and he was not heard from again for several years until he contacted his grandmother in Mexico before she passed away. Since Judith did nothing wrong, she was not charged with any crime, and police stated that they were relieved to finally put an end to the mystery and close the case for good. Number 4 Widely regarded as one of the last confrontations of the Cold War, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan on Christmas Eve of 1979 in an effort to protect the Soviet-backed government against rebels who had received their training from both Western and Islamic countries. Bakratin Kakimov was one of the soldiers who were deployed to Afghanistan during this time, and during the battle, in September of 1980, he was struck down. He survived, however, and was spotted by Afghan tribesmen who tried to pick him up and removed him from the battlefield. After that, his fate remained unknown for the next 33 years. No one had any idea what had happened to him, and he was considered to be a missing person. Then, in February of 2013, a team from Warriors Internationalists Affairs Committee an organization from Moscow who searches for former Soviet soldiers that are missing in action, found him alive and well still living in Afghanistan. When he was tracked down, he didn't have any identification papers on him, and he could barely speak any Russian. He could, however, converse in his Uzbek language and was able to identify photos of other Soviet soldiers who had served with him at the time. The effects of his time at war were still apparent as his hand trembled and he had a visible tick in one of his shoulders. He explained that after he was rescued by the tribesmen, he was nursed back to health by a village elder who was an herbal healer. The healer taught Kakimov his trade, and he would eventually go on to marry one of the women in the village after converting to Islam in 1993, and he changed his name to Sheikh Abdullah. He stated that he was keen to meet up with his relatives, who he hadn't seen since he was deployed, 
Local reports on the incident differ from those reported by the Russians, however. A local reporter who spoke to Kakimov stated that the man separated from his unit after stealing one of their weapons. They claim that he then handed it over to enemy forces and deserted. Kakimov now lives a semi-nomadic lifestyle alongside the people who rescued him. Number 3 Jacqueline Raines Crackman and Melvin Apoff both disappeared from Nebraska in 1965. First, Jacqueline vanished from Columbus on the 24th of September, followed by Apoff, who vanished exactly one month later from Rising City. Jacqueline told her family that she was leaving for a wedding in Iowa with the girlfriend, but while she was packing, her younger sister, Sharon, noticed that she was packing everything she owned into two large suitcases, and she knew something was out of place. She started to feel uneasy, especially since Jacqueline had stated months earlier that when her ship came in, she would be leaving to go somewhere where it was sunny and warm. Later that day, Sharon and a friend were driving around when they spotted Jacqueline in a car with three friends. She was crouched down in the back seat as if she didn't want to be seen. After her disappearance, when her friends asked where they had taken her, they refused to answer and for the next 40 years, she would remain a missing person. In 1999, Jacqueline's older sister Becky, who was working at Walmart at the time, spotted a woman in the store who she was certain to be Jacqueline. Before she could make sure though, she was called away to help another checker, and when she returned, the woman, who was wearing jean capris and a pink blouse, had left the store. When she told her fellow employees what had happened, they told her that she'd probably seen an angel, but Leslie was adamant that it was her sister, given that she had the same parting in her hair, the same mole above the right side of her lip, and the same dark brown eyes. It would later come to light that three months before Apoff disappeared, Jacqueline's husband had told Myrna Apoff, Melvin's wife, that the two were having an affair, an allegation that Melvin vehemently denied, but he then started acting differently. On the 24th of October, Melvin told Myrna that he was going out for a beer, and this was the last time she saw him. He took no clothes with him or any of his other possessions aside from his coin collection. When she told his family that he hadn't come home and didn't show up for work, they told her to go back into town and keep quiet. They would finally file a missing persons report the following day. Jacqueline wasn't reported missing until 1994 as her family decided to keep her disappearance quiet. Then in April of 2009, Jacqueline and Melvin were found living together outside the state of Nebraska. They declined to give any more information on their disappearances and have stated that they just want to be left alone. Number 2 In 1975, 36-year-old Flora Stevens was an employee at the Concord Hotel at a Catskills resort in Monticello, about 70 miles outside of New York City. One afternoon in August, her husband dropped her off at a doctor's appointment, and that was the last time he would ever see her. Flora was reported missing as a missing person, and she would remain missing for the next 42 years, long after her husband passed away not knowing what had happened to her. Police were certain that the case would never be solved and that Flora had probably passed away by this time. But in 2017, they got a break in the case. A state police investigator contacted the Sullivan County Sheriff's Office when remains matching Flora's profile were found. This prompted Sheriff's Detective Rich Morgan to start searching for any living relatives of Flora's, and he was shocked by what he found. After searching through federal, state, and local databases, he found that someone in Massachusetts was using Flora's social security number. He drove up to Lowell, Massachusetts, accompanied by his partner, 
Detective Ed Klaus. They made their way to a local nursing home and found a woman living there who matched Flora's description. When they showed her an old employee photograph from the Concord Hotel, her face immediately lit up and she seemed to recognize herself. Flora was suffering from late middle stage dementia and was only able to speak one or two words every now and then. She looked at the photograph and was able to utter a single word, me. That's when they were certain that the 42-year-old mystery of her disappearance had finally been solved. They tried to get more information from her about the day that she vanished, but due to her disease, she wasn't able to provide them with any more details, and the circumstances surrounding her disappearance will forever remain a mystery that only she has the answers to. Number 1 65-year-old Alex Cooper was a local businessman from Cranbrook, British Columbia, who worked in the cleaning industry from 1974 to 1983. He was also an accomplished musician and was much loved by his family. In 1986, he took a job as a salesman, which meant that he had a lot of time on the road. On the morning of the 4th of April, 1987, his daughter Layla and his son-in-law Pete left Cranbrook to do some shopping. As they drove across a bridge, they spotted his car parked on the side of the road and they decided to pull over to talk to him. They walked past his car and down to the riverbank where they assumed that he was fishing. However, when they got there, he was nowhere to be found. Layla started to worry since Alex had a heart condition and she immediately phoned her mother, Margaret. She asked her mother if she knew where she was but she stated that she hadn't seen him for about 24 hours. They contacted the hospitals in the area to check if he had been admitted but this proved fruitless and they contacted police to file a missing persons report. When police arrived at his vehicle, they found no footprints or evidence suggesting foul play. The car was locked and inside, they found some of his clothing and fishing equipment. Authorities launched an extensive land and air search but this too was to no avail. They would later learn that Alex had eaten lunch at a nearby restaurant on the same day. Margaret told police that he was in the habit of paying from a large roll of cash and she was concerned that someone may have seen the money and robbed him. Layla, on the other hand, feared that he may have suffered a heart attack and fallen into the river. When his disappearance was covered by the media, witnesses came forward to tell police that they'd seen a man matching Alex's description hitchhiking in the area where his car was found, and police assumed that he'd left of his own free will. Margaret would later learn that there was no birth certificate military, or medical history in Alex's name, and that he was not the man he pretended to be. On the 10th of January, 1992, he was located in Hamilton, Canada, where he revealed that his name was Alban Arsenault. After being falsely accused of a robbery in 1948, he changed his name and disappeared for 44 years. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.